cloud. Here we go. Okay, let's start that over again. Uh, okay. Uh, so my name is Yi Chong Chong, and I'm the Academic Programs Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center here in Newport, Oregon, and I'll be your host of today's talk. Uh, some basic logistics for our seminar. Uh, we have your mics, cameras, and screen share uh, off. Uh, we ask that you keep them off uh, for this event, um, and I will be monitoring uh, the, the participant list. Um, please ask any questions you might have using the chat box found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, at any time, we will answer any questions uh, uh, sorry, found at the bottom of your screen at any time, and we will answer any questions at the end of this talk. Uh, we will be recording this event and it will be posted in a few days on the HMSC website under past seminar page. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, so next week's seminar on September 17th, Thursday, again, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, just Justin Hudson from the University of Manitoba will be talking about um, Arctic marine mammals. The title of the talk is Blow, Baleen, and Dentine, Alternative Matrices for Studying the Physiology of Marine Mammals. And then again, will be next Thursday. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our fabulous Cami Ellingson. Uh, she's the Watershed Program Manager at the Sayusla National Forest. Um, and uh, her presentation will be on valuing water, learning from the past to add resilience to our future. Uh, what I wanna tell you is Cami Ellingson is a hydrologist with over 20 years of field experience, ranging from landslide studies, following the 1996 storm event in Western Oregon, to road, stream, and estuary restoration. Cami has led the restoration on the Salmon River Estuary since 2007 and has been recognized nationally and internationally for the success of physical restoration and collaborative partnerships. Cami received both her bachelor's degree in natural resource management and her master's in forest engineering and hydrology from Oregon State University. Uh, and with that, I'll hand, I'll, I'll hand over the helm to Cami. <laughs> thank you, Chung. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and, and healthy. Um, I'm certainly distracted today by everything that's going on. Um, I have family displaced and can't really go outside and was already, you know, feeling a bit impacted with everything. So we'll see how this goes. I'm in a tiny office under my stairwell. So if you hear thumping, it's just my daughter coming down the stairs. If you hear the dogs barking, I'll try to mute and save you from the disturbance and uh, start up again as soon as they quiet down. But, but we'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a stab at this, so. Okay, um, well, why this title? I think what I mean here is that we can learn from our past and, and we should, and where possible, I, I think we should be paying attention and I think we should be digging deep to understand uh, what these systems, I'm going to speak specifically to stream systems and estuarine systems, but um, depositional valleys, what these systems look like really before we started tinkering with them. So as Yi Chung mentioned, I claimed landslides immediately following the 96 flood, 100 year flood event here in Western Oregon and witnessed firsthand the power of water. As a hydrologist, I think a lot about natural processes. And when we implement restoration projects, what, what is our end goal? What, what is it based on? <laughs> and how will future storms and droughts interact with the site that we are investing money into? This became important information for me when I began thinking about how to discuss physical hydro hydrologic processes and process-based restoration in a more general sense. And really, how do we as a society treat our water, arguably one of our most precious resources? So I live in Corvallis, Oregon, and this is a LIDAR image of the Willamette River and the Willamette River historic uh, flood path um, channels, how the Willamette would have adjusted to floods and different sediment loads, and in the interest of thinking about reference conditions and system resilience, a stream system resilience, um, you know, I think about this a fair amount. And while we can't give the mighty Willamette this kind of space, nor do I want to, because I 
live here. <laughs> uh, I do think we need to think about what our end goal is in restoration and why. What, what are we trying to achieve? So between the 17th century to the early 20th century, European settlements started um, uh, really from the east to the west and, and um, during different um, extents across that time. Pre-European settlement conditions were stream conditions of shallow and a branching, very connected to their floodplain type systems. However, the research, the geomorphic studies that, that inform much of, I went to, much of what I went to school for uh, didn't really occur until the, the 50s. So at what point in time are we aiming for? What is our reference condition? And if we think about the impacts of settlement, it would have been active development and drainage of desirable flat land close to water used for navigation, but it also would have been passive by just trapping beavers out, resulting in a failure of large stable wetland complexes and an unraveling of pre-settlement reference conditions really before anyone was paying attention. Here is a, an example. This, this is a time sequence of the Upper Rhine River in Germany from 1828 to 1963. So I'm, I'm showing you this to, to help emphasize my point about the condition of these depositional valleys before European settlement. And the transition of these areas, so this, this here is um, 1828 prior to any river training. Here is an anabranch system, but also a, a main kind of primary deepened and straightened channel. And here by 1963, a fully single thread deepened channel um, incised and disconnected from the floodplain. Another key factor worth pointing out and brought to my attention in a presentation by Dr. Suzanne Foudy, a retired uh, Forest Service geomorphologist and hydrologist, is, it, is again emphasizing that a bulk of what I went to school for and the studies uh, of, of hydrology were um, based in 1953, 1955, 1957 by Leopold Maddock, Wollman, and Wollman and Leopold, establishing that the dominant drainages at that time and, and when those uh, studies were completed had already been altered by um, both the removal of beavers and uh, development. I had the good fortune to go to the Danube River and meet with the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube in 2013. And one of the things I found so interesting is that in 1996, they also had uh, significant flooding along the Danube River. And m much of what was occurring at that time was essentially using the river as a, a dumping ground. But by 2015, they had run, won the CIS International River Prize. And with that, they, they started to change the culture and the, and the social um, uh, understanding, I guess, or, or emphasis of this river. And they had, a, they had a, uh, a theme called Let the River Breathe. And they were starting to buy up big swaths of land along the floodplain of the Danube River and by, again, between 1996 and 20, 2015, they were able to really change the um, understanding and emphasis of a dynamic system like the Danube River. And of course, if they can do that there, where the Danube goes through 19 countries, you know, six of which aren't even recognized by the European Union, I think we can do it in some of the places here. This is in North Devon in England. This is, uh, I'm going to go through a series of slides here to just show you a beaver reintroduction between 2011 and 2016. So bringing back beavers to England was, is controversial. Um, so these beavers were contained in an enclosure and all the data pre and post was collected. And during that time, they constructed 13 dams. So in five years, they constructed each of these numbered dams that you see across here. They also studied the volume of water held by each of the dams and then how that impacted the uh, flood events 
the, the, the hydrograph for the area and the, excuse me, the, um, oh gosh, let's see, the, the stream temperatures downstream and the sediments and nutrients that were coming off of an intensively managed farm upstream, how those, that phosphorus and nitrate was filtered in those 13 ponds and um, they looked at water quality downstream. So in that five years, the water storage expanded from 900 square feet of area um, and, and water storage to 19,000 square feet of area. So they, they uh, let's see, and it, this was only along a 600 foot stretch of stream channel. So increasing the holding capacity of this area or the, of the volume of water stored to 58,000 gallons. Here's a hydrograph. So they were looking at flood flows and you can see that in the area of the uh, beaver dams, the hydrograph is muted. Um, it tapers, it takes that uh, peak down because there's so much of an area for that water to be distributed. So as well as affecting the storage and flow of water um, impounded behind these beaver dams, it affected the water quality. As I mentioned, this was below or the, the intensively managed agricultural land is just upstream of these 13 beaver dams. And so they were looking at the improvement to the water quality as well. So beavers were intensively trapped out for their pelts through the 1800s. So by the mid 1950s, when foundational hydrologic and geomorphic data was collected, over 150 years had passed where the streams had already deepened and incised and um, disconnected from their floodplain. So here are three examples of dramatic changes in stream flow and geomorphology when beaver populations are altered. Here's the example, uh, the first one I'll start with is in the upper Mississippi and Missouri River Basin. Loss of beaver ponds resulted in huge losses of flood control and system stability during years of both droughts and floods. The Elk Island National Park in Alberta, Canada. Between 1948 and 2002, they documented the presence and absence of beavers and the wetland complexes that attenuated floods and mitigated droughts. Crane Creek, Oregon, beavers were present until 1924, maintaining meadows of native grasses subirrigated by beaver ponds. But the beavers were trapped out in 1924, and by 1935, the stream channel had unraveled and deepened by 25 feet. The beavers were introduced, uh, reintroduced in 1936, and by 1938, the water table had risen and hay meadow production had improved. In 1939, a drought year, water was abundant where there were beaver ponds. All right, here's a visual tool to describe the hydrology of our natural streams and rivers. So just using some language, talking about depositional valleys for, versus transport reaches. I'm um, referring to these steep channels here where the sediments, gravels, and wood all move down onto the flat ground. As soon as that stream flow hits the flat ground, those gravels and sediments and wood drop out and uh, add to that complexity of the stream channel on the valley bottom where that's possible. So for hundreds of years, we have actively converted our depositional stream reaches into transport reaches. And we've done a really good job. So we've ditched and channelized and disposed of water very effectively, starting really with the removal of beavers that was historically and in large numbers, uh, that were historically and in large numbers constructing and maintaining large stable wetlands across low gradient valleys. And then more intentionally with the passing of the U.S. Swamp Act in 1850. Here's an example of that. Here in Camas Creek, it's in South Central Idaho, you can see a historic channel network versus the 1960s, using air quotes, improved channel outlined in red. So what they've done is they've straightened the channel, they're calling that the improved Camas Creek. This is actually what we're trying for oftentimes now in our restoration process. So 
So now at, at this time, and I, I'm, I'm gonna speak to the evolution of our restoration program as well, it's generally accepted that river and stream management that works with the natural processes rather than against them is more sustainable and more likely to achieve a variety of land management goals. So don't worry too much about this. I guess I just wanna introduce you to the stream evolution model. And I wanna to speak to what Clure and others have determined about the stream evolution model. And, and basically it was that there, there was a stage, a, re a really critical stage missing. Essentially, Clure and Thorne have added this stage zero, which is prior to the one through eight here. Stage zero would be the equivalent of pre-European settlement conditions, prior to people either passively or actively tinkering with the processes that shape the streams and rivers and low gradient valleys. And remember, so at that pre-European settlement condition is a swampy meadow comprised of shallow and a branching channel, very connected to the floodplain and the water table. Why is this important? What does that pre-European settlement condition offer? It offers a system room to react. It uh, maximizes flood attenuation, maximizes groundwater recharge, and um, adds resilience to the system in a time of changing conditions. It also, in a time of low flow or um, minimal rainfall in the coast range, for instance, if we, if we go longer stretches of time with, without that significant uh, rainfall, um, it allows that stream channel, which is shallow, to be readily connected and, and recharging and integ integrating with that floodplain. So in the Saisla National Forest, our restoration program has evolved. From 1999 to 2000, and well, now actually with Five Mile Bell, um, we've moved from over-designed single thread channels to under-designed sinuous folding channels to a braided network of channels or to a full stage zero restoration bringing us all the way back to an attempt at that end goal of a pre-settlement reference condition, pre-European settlement reference condition. I'll show you some examples. This was completed in 1999, and uh, there are a lot of us who would just like to go right back in there and do some more work. This was an over-designed single thread channel, and we were only able to, to treat a, a portion of the, of the depositional valley. This is Karnowski Creek. This won some uh, international recognition with the Feast River Prize, a fantastic project completed in 2005. And we were getting closer, I think. We, we developed, um, we reconnected and, and reestablished very sinuous, underdesigned, um, undersized uh, stream channels, still probably overly deepened, but it, it was removing it from a ditch and allowing it to then reconnect with that depositional floodplain. Drift LC, more tidal influence here and, and also an interesting site with its own limitations. Five Mile Bell phased over about the last eight years. And here you're seeing an implementation of a, of a braided network of channels. This is very much sand across this depositional valley. It had been ditched and straightened due to development um, or ranching actually. What the system did with this was, was quite interesting. And in, in the first flood flow, it just rearranged all of those channel networks. So in Five Mile Bell, we've evolved to full stage zero restoration projects. Salmon River Estuary, having very much to do with the tides and sediments and how that area responds to tides and sediments when they're cut off, uh, when these, these low marshes are cut off from the tides for um, you know, 30 plus years. So in a, with changing climatic conditions, with increased tidal surge, uh, with increased rainfall peak flood events potentially happening more frequently, and or in the coast range, perhaps less rain and, and longer periods without the kind of um, recharge that we need in a very flashy area. I want to give a, a couple of examples. 
So the areas here with the numbers were cut off from the tide for a period of time. And the area with the reference marsh indicates um, just that, a, a reference condition marsh that wasn't cut off from the tide, no tide gates. And what I'm gonna walk you through is some, some of what occurred behind each of those dikes for the length of time that they were cut off from the tide. So this is a LIDAR image. And here you're seeing the reference marsh uh, from this photo here, reference marsh. And each of the years then is depicting the year that the dike was removed. And all I want you to understand here is that the reference marsh in this nice pink color is higher. And everything else with this yellow is lower. And I'm gonna tell you why. So this is Main Street Pixie Land, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the amusement park that was built on the tidal marsh. That's Main Street Pixie Land following restoration. That's Main Street Pixie Land under a flood flow event with a tide of only a 7.8 foot tide, but we've had six days of solid rain. Same location. Here is Fraser Creek, which is uh, finally, finally got an opening under 101 to reconnect to a remnant uh, dead end slough channel on the west side of 101. Um, here's that site on the 6th of December, just following the completion of these culverts in October. And here it is the next day on the 7th. And this is the outlet. You're, this, this site here, this is Highway 101 is looking directly toward um, Cascade Head. If you were standing here, you, you would look, be looking toward Cascade Head. Here's an image across the reference marsh. I took this photo in 2008. Here's a February 9th photo in 2017 with an 8.7 foot tide, not even a king tide, and uh, only four or five solid days of rainfall. And I, I just wanna emphasize when you're fighting nature, um, this system is, is unique because it's estuarine, but I'm gonna walk you through what occurs in these area, areas when you um, put up the dike and prevent the tide from coming in. So here's the mean higher high water level. That's what regulates these marsh elevations, extreme high tide. I'm just naming some of the areas along the transition zone, along the bathtub edge. This is a cross channel, of course, this is the, this deep, deep, sinuous stream channels, tidal channels that exist that connect these marshes to uh, the estuary and also connect them um, and bring in that, that uh, freshwater flow. So it's, it's the, the meeting of the two and then spilling out onto these marsh floors. So flat ground is in high demand in the coast range. So you, using it in every way possible is um, certainly what the um, early European settlers began doing. And in order to do that, they had to construct, well, the tide of course caused problems with using that low flat ground. So constructing these earthen dams um, or levees allowed them to keep this area behind the dike dry. In order to drain the freshwater out, they had to put culverts in with tide gate flaps to bring the fresh water out and prevent the tide water from coming in so that again they can keep these areas drier for a longer period of the of the year. What starts to happen with these drainage features is the ground starts to just to subside behind here. Uh, primarily it's because you're not getting the sediments that are carried in with the flood flows but you're also not re-wetting this very organic soil that's a layer cake of organic material and, um, and heavy organic uh, peat. And it starts to oxidize and decay. And so you have subsidence occur. So some landowners will choose to lower the tide gate and continue to try to chase this down and drain this water out. Um, but you end up with groundwater holding in behind the, the tide gates. Um, you end up with an area that doesn't drain even as fast as the adjacent marshland um, nearby that, that isn't um, siped. So here's another image you can see. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is that the, the duration of time cut off from the tides did impact recovery. 
and the rate of response in terms of even the vegetation. The 96 marsh was like the longest of these three. And it had subsided close to three feet by the time the dike and the tie gate came out. So compared to the reference marsh, it's set, you know, three or so feet lower. The 78 marsh wasn't diked as long. It's closest to the elevation of the reference marsh. And the 87 is, is kind of in, in between the two. We did learn that that habitat complexity versus a simplified ditched habitat really does matter. And that the growth rates of the fish recovery are Im impressive. And the length of time and the duration of coho um, use and Chinook use in the estuary once these tidal channels were opened up to them was significant. So you can see here that 30% of the adult returning uh, coho used the and are tied to and connected to the restored Salmon River estuary marshes and 75% of the Chinook adult returns were connected to these restored sites. So just a couple points here, the, the stream, the, I'm sorry, the life history resilience, it, it, you know, there was, there was a time when, when people believed that the uh, young rearing fish just went to the ocean and chose to do so. But in many cases, they didn't have an option. And uh, when these areas were opened up to them, they, there wasn't a delay at all. They came in immediately and they stayed for much longer than people first thought. So those life history patterns are, are um, being exhibited here to the full extent. It also indicated to us that the bottom up restoration can be effective all on its own. Oftentimes the Forest Service isn't in a situation where we have uh, ownership or, or say in what goes on in the, in the tidal systems and the, and the marshlands, but Salmon River Estuary has been one of those places where that's about all we own um, and all we have any you know, uh, say over, aside from uh, the experimental forest on the headland, the, the bulk of the watershed is privately owned. I'm not going to speak to this much, but just thinking about both the um, estuaries, the small tidal systems, how much of that land has been lost and cut off to the Oregon Coast Coho uh, across their evolutionary, evolutionarily significant unit, kind of lining you up with those systems and the ESU for Coho and the Saisla National Forest ownership. Also reminding folks that we can work off our ownership if we can point to a direct benefit and that we have a strong stewardship program which allows us to invest funding into um, restoration work that would that would uh, that we could make that argument for so here's this is from the headland this is at the salmon river estuary there's been a lot of talk about the sand spit and the river mouth and other alterations that are still occurring here due to european beach grass i uh, won't be speaking to that today just like the photo and it's a reminder to me to shift a little bit this is the um a project on the mckinsey river this is um, a stage zero <laughs> project and a, a very interesting site. Um, so what they've managed to do here is give the system full um, option, I guess, to work and connect within this low gradient depositional valley. And the the amicetes, the, the uh, lamprey amicetes are the numbers and, and the kinds of data that they're collecting off this site have uh, proven to be pretty mind boggling. So the, the restoration is, is quite interesting and, and it'll be one to watch through time. And so again, of course we can't reconnect these large systems to their full potential, but perhaps in places like this, um, this is again the Salmon River Estuary, we can be strategic and we can reconnect and restore the hydrology. This is that South Fork McKenzie River project again on the Willamette National Forest. And this was a stage zero, but you can see the adults returning here. And then this is the area where the lamprey amicete numbers um, were well beyond what anyone thought. Or this site, which is also, this is actually main main uh, the main area of pixie land where the hydrology of a system has been restored 
we see the, the beavers move in within the first year. So this is a photo point monitoring site. This is Fraser Creek that was reconnected. Um, it had been ditched and, and diked all the way around an amusement park on the tidal marsh. Here we, we did the best we could and we kind of, we put it through one main um, single thread channel. The criticism that we received for this restoration project was that we weren't constructing enough channels, that there was um, historically many, many more channels uh, than we were creating. The good news is the beavers moved in within the first year and five beaver dams were constructed and they completely altered the flood flow and, the, and the, even the low flow channels of Fraser Creek. And what you can see in this image is the den of the beavers that have uh, moved into Pixie Island. And really they've moved into all of our restoration sites. This is Crowley Creek. This is a tributary to Crowley Creek. This is also in the Salmon River Ashwaries. Photos taken by Duncan Berry. And you can see the elk in the background. What the beavers are seeming to do in the Salmon River Ashwaries is they're, or even in, in, in ashwaries that we're, that we're looking at, is they're moving up to the tributaries when the flood flows get too great and when the tidal pressure becomes too great in the um, lower portions of the ashwaries. So again, I'm just going to emphasize why this is important. I, I believe in, in a face of a, of a claim, changing climatic conditions, maximal flood attenuation, thinking about groundwater recharge, and adding resilience to our systems is in our best interest. And the coast range, I'm going to show a hydrograph in a second here, but um, we've seen increasing peak flood events meaning that, you know, by definition and by probability, a 25-year flood event, we've, we've seen multiple 25-year flood events in a shortened uh, period of time, which makes me start to think about our, our vocab and our, um, our uh, the future of, you know, how these systems are going to respond to that. We're also uncertain about droughts. There's, some of the models are indicating, and of course, in the coast range, there's very little, um, understood about the coast range hydrology, many of the models are snow driven models and they don't necessarily take into consideration the factors that are important in the coast range. We really don't have storage in snow. We don't have storage in our geology. So when we get rain, we have stream flow, but when we don't get rain, we don't have stream flow and our stream flows drop very quickly. And we call this a, you know, just a flashy response. W one of the things that we're starting to understand is that we might have a more concentrated period of four months where we get all of our rainfall, and then we might go eight months without much rainfall. And essentially, if we've converted our depositional valleys to transport reaches, reaches then we're discarding that water that we do get. And we're not thinking about then how that could um, work for us or recharge our water tables. And then fog is a big question. We don't really know what's happening or going to happen with the fog, and none of the models take that into account. We don't know if we're going to have heating all the way to the ocean, ocean edge, preventing that marine layer from coming in, and um, you know, certainly thinking about uh, fires um, and uh, what's going on right now. It, it, would, it would be hard for me not to at least bring that up and, and uh, say that a lot of the models indicate that that the coast range was going to continue to, to have very little trouble with fire. But for a rainforest to be burning the way that it is right now, um, you know, shows you that we really have wrung that sponge out and a lot of these areas are, are quite dry. So here's that hydrograph I was talking about. And it's a period between 1988 and 2015. And I just wanted to point out the, you know, kind of the peak um, flood events. And you can just see how flashy these systems are, the ups and the downs, because we, again, we don't have that, that storage that um, um, maybe, you know, the coastal, or I'm sorry, the, the snow-dominated areas have. But you can see that in this period of time, <clears throat> let's see, six times, I believe, since 1988, we reached that 25-year flood event line. And so just thinking about how frequently that might occur 
Here's a LIDAR image of the Salmon River estuary, and this is with sea level rise and thinking about our current mean high tide in this light blue or, or whitish color, the one meter increase in this blue here, and of course these areas flood by flooding up their channels and then overflowing out onto the marsh floor. A two meter increase is this darker blue. Highway 101 is a dam essentially across the estuary dividing it in two. And what isn't taken into account in this is any freshwater flow with this tidal signature. So I, I just want folks to think about that. If, if each of these areas were still cut off to receiving the tide, that flood water would have to go somewhere. So <clears throat> here's a squashed <clears throat> Google image. You can see this is the sand spit and the mouth and then each of the years of the restoration work in the Salmon River estuary. Here's head of tide and the fish hatchery here. So this area used to receive enough flood pressure in just a bankful event where emergency crews were having to put the fish back in the holding ponds at the hatchery. And they haven't had to do that since this 10 and 11, 2010 and 11 Pixie Land site was restored. It's anecdotal, but I think just understanding that this flood water has to go somewhere, and that's what these areas, that's essentially the creation of these areas and how they're maintained. I think quite a bit about a deepened channel draining an area even more effectively than a shallow channel. And so thinking too about these shallow anabranching channels that used to span these depositional valleys during a time where we may go eight months without much rainfall, um, it, it really would have a direct impact on available water. I didn't take this picture. I, wish I had. It took this guy four years in southern France to take this picture. Um, but thinking about our, our water, valuing it, thinking about that the wetland habitats and a path to a resilient future. So, you know, maybe we can't give streams and rivers the space to breathe or implement stage zero restoration techniques on a, on a broad scale. Um, but with uncertain future, future conditions, Perhaps we do need to allow the past to inform the future. This is a photo by Joe Wheaton. This is in Idaho. This is an area that burned. And here's this oasis of beaver wetland complex down in the bottomlands. This is a sign that's used in Utah. Um, and I, I find it interesting because a number of these restored sites that that we're so interested in. The beavers do come back right away, but we're having trouble understanding why it is that they, that they, that they don't stay. So here's adult coho up at Five Mile Bell. This is in Bell Creek, right? Just right following some of the restoration work that we completed. And just a beautiful photo that a coworker of mine, Barbell Sugai, who's retired now, took a few years ago. And with that, I will just take questions. It's so strange not talking to faces out there. I would much rather be speaking to all of you in person. Yeah, it is strange, but uh, we're making the best of it. <laughs> Thank you, Cami. Any questions from online uh, via chat or uh, verbally? Uh, any plans to further restore Enchanted Valley? Yes, we're talking about it. Um, there was an interesting controversy at the time. There was a belief by a lot of the local folks and probably even the district manager of the Forest Service at the time that elk needed the stream channels straightened and off to the side in order to navigate um, the, these low depositional valleys. And so it was really controversial and, and I, I chuckle about it now, but um, a big portion of Bailey Creek, we had to leave in a ditch to accommodate that that interest group, and we did. And it resulted in um, huge issues, as you can imagine, with the hydrology. When we talk about fighting natural processes, that's, um, it's, it's really been problematic to the recovery of the site. So it's definitely a place that we would like to get back to. So another question, Cami, online from Sarah. So the question is, how would the channels, how would the channels change if the roads were diverted? perhaps under the water as opposed to a dam type of effect? 
uh, regarding 101 at the dam across the estuary? I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, well, if, if for those of you who are aware of where 101 used to go, it, it actually used to go around um, behind the town of Otis and, and up into the, I, it's just hard for me to, because I'm hearing that that area is just burning right now, which is um, really sad to, to talk about. But that old scenic 101 is the old original Highway 101, it was built in the 30s. And so when the Cascade Head Scenic Research Management Act was passed Congress in 74, the management plan team of people wanted the highway rerouted. And that was in um, 77, that management plan went into place. So even at that time, they were concerned. And the, and the highway was built in 61, straightened and, and coming across the estuary in 61. So, um, you know, even, even shortly after the Highway 101 was constructed in that straightened path, uh, there were folks who understood the impacts on you know, Chum and uh, Salmonid access to these salinity gradients that they would be seeking. So um, when we did a student charrette and we identified all the different restoration options, the student group, which is an interdisciplinary team of students, did a Photoshop image of a lifted viaduct across the estuary. And um, ODOT, um, you know, that the costs of that would be prohibitive. So um, there has been talk and, and pushback with, with ODOT to even consider, you know, a reroute. Um, but it, aside, aside from, you know, these big extreme options, I think even just the, the stacked culverts like we did for Fraser Creek would allow that tidal regime recovery and that mixing of, you know, the tidal and the freshwater to occur. Um, reconnecting Salmon Creek would be, in my opinion, the next step because Salmon Creek is triple the size of Fraser Creek. We've put two 12-foot box culverts for Fraser. Um, Salmon Creek honestly would warrant a bridge, but there's not really the funding or the, or the conversation brewing right now to to deal with that. And the river itself, the bridge there is so undersized. There's scour at the footings of that bridge, both on the east side during big deep freshwater events and on the west side during big tidal surge. So another question online from uh, Paul Engelmeyer. Um, how about revisiting lower drift creek estuary work? <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, yeah, I would love to. It, it just seems more and more like our our capacity internally and our um, priorities are, uh, you know, dictating um, where we go, not only where we go, but also how we uh, utilize our really limited capacity. We were limited in drift LC with what we could do as well. There was a private piece that we didn't have at the time and there were some access issues. Um, you know, some of those things have changed. So I think a revisit wouldn't be a bad idea. Paul, you can help with that. Yeah, <laughs> help, Paul. <laughs> um, another question online here, Cami. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, thank you. What is your message to OSU researchers and ODFW biologists who do not believe that the streams, rivers, and floodplains of Oregon are dominated by the signature of past anthropogenic actions? They're not dominated. Right. Well, um, between the splash damming, the wood removal, and then putting it back, um, the straightening and the and the ditching, the ditching, you know, and the, and essentially the drainage of these low, these low reaches. Um, it's hard for me to see it without that. I mean, there's there's. There's systems like Lytle Creek, which we use as a reference for a lot of the work that we've been doing in depositional valleys, which is above Tackenich Lake. Um, and I, I can think of just a small handful of places where I don't, I don't see um, our tinkering, you know, and, and the signature of, of that. But for the most part, in many of the other ones, I mean, there's lots of discussion about reference, reference conditions. And where are they and, and are they informing, uh, you know, what we're doing and just finding them and agreeing uh, that they 
they are, you know, that kind of true reference condition uh, pre, um, pre impact is, uh, is controversial. So I just would be willing to, to talk more about it. And I, I love going in the field and, and just having more conversations about, um, you know, what I'm seeing and, and what others are seeing and, and just trying to inform how we spend, you know, it's, it's great to secure this grant money that, that we often get. And I, and I definitely want to be learning and spending it the, to the best of our ability. I'm, I'm sure that there's things that we're doing now too, that we're going to look back and think, what were we thinking? <laughs> but just doing the best we can to try to um, restore the processes is, you know, my end goal. Another question from Rebecca uh, Vietz. Uh, are there any noticeable changes to river water temperatures after these areas are restored? Yes. Yeah, we have long-term temperature data at Karnowski Creek. Um, we have temperature pre-post data at Five Mile Bell. Some at Salmon River Estuary, but it's a little different because it's a, you know, kind of a different system. Um, we're seeing lower water temperatures. We're also seeing, we have piezometers at a number of the sites to look at that groundwater connection, that water table connection. And we're seeing more uh, distributed groundwater in the, you know, the, that water table elevated over broader periods or broader periods of the year and, and broader areas in the depositional valleys. Which of course would influence the temperature. I think we have one last question from Rob Walton uh, about how many times do you think beaver have been trapped out of the areas in, um, uh, I guess that SNF? Uh, National Forest. Tysla National Forest that were restored to support coho salmon. Um, Karnowski, I would say without a doubt. I had an expert with me out there and um, all 23 dams had deteriorated at about the same if not at the, you know, the exact rate, which wouldn't indicate a predator just taking one or two. It would have indicated a, you know, kind of a full removal of a colony in Karnowski. We were so excited that the beavers were coming back into Karnowski Creek because like I said, it was, it was um, a 2005 restoration with a technique that, you know, we looked back with critical eyes, um, but you know, it, it could have, we would do something differently there. But to see what the beavers were doing was exactly what we wanted. And they only got a you know four year run at it before something happened and they were not there. Um, there were two traps at the Salmon River Estuary in 2015, and there were beavers shot and left at Crowley Creek, a family of three, of an adult and two subadults. Um, we lost beavers at Andy Creek in the Sand Lake drainage, where there had been a 27 year beaver complex, a wetland complex that we've had documented for well before my time with the Forest Service and they're not there now. The willow are plentiful and the habitat remains, but the, but the beavers are, are not there. So many, many sites and Spilkus River, they've been just, they were just recently removed from there. Um, so very frustrating <laughs> because the, you know, our end goal when we're trying to reset the hydrology is to, is for, for that very thing to occur. For you know, for them to come back and, uh, and be taking over where we left off. I had a follow-up question to that. Um, so, do you know what the regulation is currently for trapping beaver in Oregon? Yeah, um, on on public land, they um, there's supposed to be a notification and a, a permit process. I don't believe that's occurring on private land. They can be even shot and left or killed just if they're causing a, a, a nuisance, um, causing a problem or predating trees. They're considered a predator in the state, so they um, they don't receive any protections at all. The, the legislative language doesn't even identify them as a key keystone species. Washington and California are ahead of us as the beaver state goes, but because <laughs> their language is a little more protective and or at least more um, truthful to, you know, the benefits that they provide. Okay. 
We have one more question from uh, Caitlin. Um, given the recent work by Laura Brophy and others about the particularly, particularly significant loss of tidal swamp habitats on the Oregon coast, uh, are there ways that the Sayus Law National Forest can prioritize or pinpoint areas uh, for restoration of that habitat, these tidal swamp habitats? Yeah, I, um, there is so few areas that, you know, the study slot, for instance, wouldn't have any, you know, jurisdiction or ownership of any of that land um, oh, other than in the Salmon River estuary. It's, it's the only estuary owned by a, the, the Forest Service in the lower 48, so it's a, it's a really rare circumstance. Um, but there, you know, the Sitka Sedge project, which is state parks land, is going to have some of that tidal swamp or could potentially. Um, a lot of the restoration projects that I'm familiar with that are estuarine focused can have that, that focus. Um, they, and they don't necessarily, you know, it's not that, like I'm saying they have to be Forest Service or Sayus Law National Forest projects for us to be involved because they don't. So if there's, you know, there's ample opportunity and with the, especially coho, and the life history resilience and the growth rates that we're seeing out of Salmon River Ashray research, the data is certainly there emphasizing the importance of this habitat, especially if the tidal signature is going to push that freshwater salinity gradient farther upstream into the future. So it could be that even, you know, habitats right now that aren't as significant are going to become even more significant and might even be cut off by infrastructure roads and and other things that kind of intersect with those locations. It's really, it's, it's really important and a lot of folks, uh, Becky Flipcroft, who's in the PNW Research Station, has been looking at that, you know, how that tidal signature is going to push the critical habitat for young marine fish up the river channel and is that going to be available, you know, to them. Well, um... There's, oh, there's one more question from Megan Hoff. Uh, are there any beaver reintroduction efforts happening or are the barriers just too big? Okay, you broke up a little bit. Oh, Could okay. you repeat? Yeah, are there any beaver reintroduction efforts happening or are the barriers too great? Well, there are beaver um, relocation projects in really successful ones in Washington that I'm familiar with, with the University of Washington and Tulalip tribes having, having been out with um, those folks a number of times, they're, where they're relocating nuisance beavers that were causing so much damage that they were going to just really the only option was um, uh, to kill them in that site or trap them out or, or remove them. And so the program that I was um, participated in, they, they had been able to successfully capture an entire social network and move the, the whole family to a new location. And the, that's primarily based on Natal Valley and Kent Woodruff's work, who was, he's a retired, uh, retired wildlife biologist with the Forest Service. And um, the model was carried into this project with Tulalip tribes. And because Washington's relocation rules allow the, the holding of uh, beavers in, um, you know, it's, it's a regulated, um, manner, but in order to capture the whole family, that social network piece has become very, it's very apparent that that um, improves the success of the relocation effort. They're very socially bonded as a family unit, and if you're just catching one and you're doing hard release, which um, Oregon is, is held to, your, the, the success of your relocation program is um, abysmal, you know, so it's, it's just very critical that the the whole social network where possible can be um, collected, live trapped, and then moved. And I've seen great success with projects up there. The, the, the one that I was able to get involved with, we moved them to a tributary to the Foss River, and they were in a site on tribal lands, and the tribe wanted them to be there, but they were above a county road. And they had gotten greedy, like beavers often do. And they had built a dam that was 160 feet long and about seven feet tall. And it was above a very small culvert on a stream channel. And the county was telling the tribes, you got to do something. And so we, over a three day period, captured the whole family. We moved them to a tributary of the Foss River. 
the tributary site had has had a long time ago had beavers and there were just very um, dilapidated kind of remnant sites dams where um, that had been there you know years before and when we released the beavers it was first part of July and by the end of July there would have been three to four feet of water where it had been dry because their lower check dam they had created a lower check dam and then built three additional dams just in a month. Um, so where we had been standing when we released them at the site was, you know, it was, it was dry, but it would have been, <laughs> that whole area had um, flooded due to the, especially that lower check dam um, and subsequent dams that they had constructed. So they have game cameras out there and, and were kind of piezometers looking at the groundwater table um, and, and they're collecting data, you know, pre-data and post-data. Uh, Vanessa posted something online that said uh, uh, beaver relocation work did occur across a few sites on the Sayuslaw National Forest 10 years ago, but most experienced predator cougar based mortality. Right. So. Right. And that, I, m my opinion is that stems from the hard release, the, the collecting them as individuals and releasing them on the same day. And the social network component is proven to be. Um, considerable. Um, great. Well, I think that concludes uh, all the questions that we have online. Um, I, I may have just kind of one follow up one, which is more okay. of a historical one. Um, uh, do you know anything about uh, the success or failure of, uh, I think it was in the uh, uh, 19, around mid 1950 or 60, they um, Oregon parachuted. Yeah, um, Sky Beaver Project. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Very little. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Ben Dipbrenner, who um, had been with the University of Washington and got his PhD, um, he has a, a, a little bit more information on his website on uh, Beavers Northwest. I've, I've heard he's since moved to Massachusetts, but on his Beavers Northwest website, there's a Sky Beaver project and a description of the um, boxes, the wooden boxes that the beavers were parachuted down. Um, of course, the, beaver, the boxes would break open and then the beavers would kind of stumble out and, and the, you know, the hope would be, of course, that they would um, thrive and, and uh, I don't know, I don't know the results as far as whether they did or not. My, my, my guess is that, that that didn't work all that well, but I, but I don't know if you were just feeding cougars or what you were doing. I think they're trying to get them in uh, remote areas that were inaccessible. Yes, definitely. I, I know the intent was that. Now, whether or not that succeeded, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, thank you, Cami, and thank you everyone for joining us online. Thank you, thanks for having me. Oh, here we go. The early Oregon translocation work were primary soft releases and less than 50% were successful. Yeah. So, uh, Vanessa. Great. All right, Cami. I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, take care. Take Thank care. you again for having me. You bet. Thank you, everyone.